Today we're going to talk about geospatial and logistical problems in health. So what do I mean by geospatial and logistical problems in health? Well, in healthcare, patients are either travelling to a place of health service delivery or the service itself sends assets out to visit patients. So we can think of geospatial and logistical problems in health as those problems which are related to and complicated by the geography of the region that you are studying. So this might, for example, be about the location of health delivering facilities. Those might be hospitals in general, or they might be different types of health delivering facilities. When healthcare is about delivering to patients in their own home, this is largely what we call a routing and scheduling problem, where mobile health workforce are sent out to visit patients. So there's always some key issues in this type of analysis. So the first is the availability of the services. So that might be affected in the case of nurses in terms of their shift work. And the big issue in a public health system is about equality or equity of access for service users. So it's a, it's a poor system where a group of particularly vulnerable individuals have poor access to those services relative to another group. So that's what these types of analysis aim to avoid. There's nearly always some sort of capacity issue, particularly in routing and scheduling, or it might be a throughput issue. So for example, if you are locating stroke units, you might want to aim for a certain number of strokes to go to be allocated to that particular hospital. And at the heart of this is nearly always something to do with travel time or distance from the hospital. So let's take a simple look at location of health facilities. So here we have a map and this is a map of a dialysis network. So this is a system where patients need to travel to health delivering facilities to receive um, renal replacement therapy, dialysis. So on this map, we have some stars and these stars rep uh, represent the location of dialysis treatment centers. And we also have red dots and the red dots represent the location of dialysis patients, individuals who require to use the service. And in this simple map, the size of the dot represents the number of patients in that area. Now, what can we see from this map? Well, we can see that there's clustering in the major population centres. So that's where we find most of the health delivering facilities. It's closest to those patients who live in the city centres, the highest density areas. But we have in this region of the country, we have rural areas as well. So we can see out here. There's a number of um, small number of patients who must have to travel in to their closest centre, but that's, that journey is significantly longer than others might have to make. So how, do, what's, how does this problem look from the health service perspective? So the customers of this type of analysis are, could be individual providers. They could be a, a, an individual hospital or community trust. But more likely, it will be a regional level service, for example, a group of commissioners who, who purchase healthcare, or it might be a national level organisation. So in the UK, that might be someone like NHS England, who are interested about the configuration of services across the whole of England. So here's some examples. So one example could be a city hospital that provides ophthalmology services and they need to support to decide where to locate five mobile eye clinics in the community and they want to do that equitably so they want to make sure that their users aren't particularly disadvantaged just because of where they live. Another example is a public health team who's been working with a sexual health provider organisation and they need help in reducing the number of locations for outpatient clinics. So they feel they've got too many to offer a quality service. So they need to reduce those number in a re region 
but they still need to offer equitable access. And then a national level example could be NHS England, and they want to centralise hyperacute stroke care across England. And they've got a number of objectives. So they want to maximise equity, they want to improve quality, which might mean increasing the throughput to certain centres. But also they want to make sure that there's good patient outcomes. So academics look at this in a more general sense. And there's a nice paper um, from 1999, which talks about location allocation modelling in the context of public health systems. So it tends to be used in three ways, is what they're arguing. So investigating service accessibility problems, comparing the quality in terms of efficiency of previous locational decisions. So you might be comparing a number of what if alternatives to how things currently run. Or it might be giving people advice about generating new alternatives, new ways to configure their system that would either increase efficiency or improve on patient outcomes. So the type of analysis that you will do will vary depending on the size of the problem. So if you're working, for example, with an individual provider, then there's no doubt in my mind that that will be a small problem. And that's best supported in a straightforward manner. So using a combination of mapping, so helping people understand what their demand looks like in a geospatial sense, and straightforward analysis of the problem. But when you get to medium to large scale problems in health, these location problems are interwoven with optimization. So there's a large number of combinations that need to be checked out in order to find good solutions. And that becomes a problem for simple analysis. There's just too many combinations for you to cope with. So you'll need to bring in some optimization at that point. And possibly these problems are multi-objective in nature, like we saw with the NHS England example. And again, that becomes much more complicated. The view that I would encourage you to take in all of your work is that this is decision support, not just optimization. So if you turn up to a health um, customer and just provide them with what you think is an optimal solution, that is often not very helpful to them. We need to view this as a piece of evidence within a wider problem that they're trying to solve. So just saying this is the optimal solution is often not very helpful. And we'll talk more about that later. So it's a location problem. So there's lots of types of location data that you may have to work with. So here's a list of that type of data. It's not a um, exhaustive list, list, but it is, it is types of data that I found useful. So the first type of data that um, I've worked with is, is exact data. So exact geographic coordinates, and that tends to come in two flavors, latitude and longitude which you'll no doubt be familiar with, but also northings and eastings, which is just a different type of coordinate system. And it's fairly straightforward to translate between the two. You could also have um, a slightly more crude measure, which is a full postcode. Um, so that tends to be for non-sensitive type data, same with the exact measures. Um, so that in the UK, for example, there are 1.7 million postcodes, sometimes called unit postcodes. So an example would be PO63LY. Then you can go to slightly higher levels. So for example, a postcode sector, which is on average 180 postcodes. So that is, for example, if we take our full postcode PO63LY, a postcode sector would just be the four first characters of that PO63. So that means that you've got a much bigger group of postcodes within that and a much bigger group of patients. So that's quite useful for sensitive data. So you're not identifying, you, you're unable to identify any individuals typically with a postcode sector. 
The other type of um, aggregate data that you'll typically use are super output areas. And two of the most useful ones are lower super output areas, which gives an average population of between 1,500, oh, sorry, an average population of 1,500 people or 650 um, households. Um, or, and so that may have many postcode sectors within it. Or even a higher level than that is a middle super output area, which has an average population of 7,500. Um, and you might use middle super output areas, for example, if the type of data that you're working with um, the, is only available at that level. Ideally, you would work probably at postcode set or lower super output area, but that might depend on the particular problem. OK, so the next thing we'll do is we'll have a look at um, where we might use this type of data in our analysis. Welcome back. OK, so let's have a think about where we might use this type of location data within our analysis. So the first thing to do is think about where would we use exact locations? Well, that would be with non-sensitive data. So the facility locations themselves are typically not sensitive within healthcare. This is because they're hospitals or their outpatient clinics or their GP surgeries, etc. So for these, we really need to use the full postcode or the lat long or the northings and eastings. So here, for example, we've got two hospitals, Camborne Red Roof Community Hospital and Penzance Hospital A and B. And we're able to put a pin in the map because we know exactly where those are. So that's really useful for our analysis. Patient locations, on the other hand, are, is a sensitive type of data. So the reason it's sensitive is because it may be possible, given their postcode, for example, and other types of information, to identify who that patient is. And we don't want to do that. We're not allowed to do that. And we don't need to do that. OK, so rather than using postcode data for patient locations, we would use some aggregate geographic position, for example, their postcode sector or their lower super output area or higher. Um, so, for example, we've got a map here which is looking at um, stroke admissions per 100,000 well, per thousand of populations to the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. The map um, is a zoom, it's got a zoom in of Exeter in detail, and each of these shapes within that is a lower super output area. And we can see that we've shaded that by the, the number of admissions per 1,000 of population, with the yellow here in Exeter being the, the highest rate of admission and the, um, the dark purple being the lowest rate of admission. So that's quite a good way and typically the only way you'll be working with patient locations, um, unless you're on some sort of study with very specific permission from um, the individuals involved in the study to use that, use that type of data. If you're just working with um, an NHS organisation, um, they should not be providing you full, full postcodes. Um, there may also be further protection. Um, so sometimes this varies a little bit, but if, for example, the postcode sector you're working with has less than six individuals living in that area, then that may be censored from you. So you may not know how many patients are actually in that area. That information may be held back. And that again is to try and avoid any chance of you being able to identify patients who live in there. And not necessarily just you, if you're, a, if you're doing a study when you publish the data afterwards, that data may be able to link to and then others might be able to identify who live in that area. So key to all of this location allocation modelling is the use of travel times. Um, and that's because people often have to travel to health facilities in order to use their services. And remember that some people may have many health conditions, so they may have to travel multiple times per week. Um, so if that, that starts to add up and that actually starts to become work that the patient has to do in order to be looked after and treated. And we don't really want that. So we want a fair service that provides 
healthcare as close to their home as possible. And we generally feel that the closer the service to its community, the better. And in the case of emergency healthcare, obviously, if you take the ambulance service, which is also a location problem, um, that can be life critical in the case of a stroke or a heart attack. Um, so random demand is popping up, but you want ambulances positioned in a way that they can respond well to that demand and get there as quickly as possible. So these travel times, where do they come from? Well, they typically come from um, GIS software. So in terms of, of open source, some good ones are Routino, or the open source routing machine. Um, but they are car travel times that come out of it. Um, so we need to think about, is that the right type of travel time we should be using in our analysis? Does that cause us problems? Um, so for example, in the case of ambulance service, um, that might be a bit slow. Um, so we might want to think about historical blue light travel times and the ambulance service hold that type of data if you're working with them. But what about if it's a sexual health provider, for example, which is primarily aimed at younger people, possibly people younger than the age of 17 and who don't hold a driving license? So you might, for example, in that case, need to think about public transport times. Um, and they can be more difficult to access at least reliably. Um, so you may need to think about car ownership in your study population um, and it might be that that's not a problem at all but it might indeed be a problem. So these are just things that you need to think about practically when you're doing your analysis. So let's think about the formulations of a location allocation problem. So let's have a think about the formulations of a location allocation problem. So one of the most famous formulations is to treat this as a p-median problem. So given a discrete demand, locate a number, p or less, of health facilities so that the total weighted travel distance or time between facilities is minimised. So that means that we're taking into account how many demands are coming from different geographic locations in our calculation of the mean. And we're looking for the combination of healthcare facilities that minimises that. And that works quite well. Um, it can be problematic, particularly if you're not taking into account things like maximum travel time in your analysis. But it can be a useful way to look at the problem. A second way to treat this problem is as a set covering problem. Okay, so here we're thinking about um, some sort of maximal service distance. So for example, we want everybody to be within 30 minutes of a hospital or an outpatient clinic. So we're trying to find the set of locations that, that, that meets that requirement. I think a useful different way to think of that problem is the maximal covering location problem. And so here we're going to think about locating facilities in such a way that as few people as possible lie outside the desired service distance. So I think this way of conceptualising the problem is slightly more useful to healthcare providers because it helps them think about the trade-off between how many facilities they have and the coverage that they achieve. So here's some examples of, of how you would calculate some of these in, in the p-median problem. So for example here we've got two geographic locations and both of those geographic locations um, need to travel to a hospital in Penzance. So journey A takes 10 minutes and journey B takes 30 minutes. But what we can see is that journey A has one, two, three, four, five demands, where journey B only has one demand. So what we're going to do is weight the calculation towards journey A when we work out how fair is it that we locate the, the facility here. So that's a simple calculation. So if we take journey A, there's five demands there and it takes 10 minutes. So we first do 10 minutes multiplied by five 
journey B it takes 30 minutes and there's only one demand there so we do 30 minutes times one and then we add those two together to get 80 and then our weighty av weighted average is just 80 divided by six trips in total which gives us 13.3 minutes as our weighted average now compare that to our normal way we would calculate the average which is just to add the journey times together and divide by two which is 20 minutes okay so very different so the next type of problem um, we're going to look at is the maximal covering location problem and this is a chart from a real study looking at locating sexual health clinics in Hampshire and what we can see in this chart is the percentage of demand covered by each clinic and this was within 30 minutes of the clinic car travel time and this is the number of selected locations on the x-axis um, the different lines were just different approaches that we used to compare um, to, do, to do the optimization so we used a very simple greedy algorithm we used um, some variations in what we call meta heuristics and we used an optimizer called Garobi which gave us an exact solution so what we can see is um, as the number of selected locations increases so does um, the demand that increases monotonically um, but we can see that tails off towards the end there's diminishing returns so really beyond beyond 18 um, or 19 um, outpatient locations um, there isn't much increase in performance um, and what the optimization is doing here is it's placing um, so for example if we went for 18 clinics versus 19 those solutions might look quite different um, so the chart helps you think about the trade-off in terms of coverage and then we would use mapping to help people understand what does the exact solution look like welcome back okay so let's have a think about some practical issues in doing location modeling so the first thing I just want to revisit this idea that really what we're aiming for is to support people's decisions and that's slightly different from just optimizing a system so here we have a very naive data science data scientist okay so what he's thinking is great the NHS has got a location problem so this individual's got very excited and he's gone away and he's grabbed his computer he's written some code and he's provided an optimal solution for them whoop whoop so don't be like Tom so first of all you can't model all of the complexity in the real world and you don't want to there's lots of factors that will affect where facilities are placed outside of your model including what some of the most important people in the system think the service users so a famous quote from a study I was involved in was where we wanted to move a uh, a facility from a, a location called Fairham down the road to a location called Whiteley um, and that provided a much more equitable solution according to our model however the quote is um, well the patients don't like the car parks in Whiteley so none of the patients would use that facility and that was something they'd found historically so even though on paper and in our model um, Whiteley was a far superior model in terms of equity of access um, it was not a facility that patients were willing to use so it's always worth remembering that your work is one form of evidence taken into account when making a decision so a decision maker in healthcare is synthesizing all different forms of evidence um, some of that quantitative including what you've done and some of it qualitative so you need to think of ways to help them understand the consequences of deviating from what you might think is the optimal solution for example so in the case of this study what we did was we provided a very simple tool to help them um, change which facilities were open and look at the consequences in terms of equity and capacity and throughput of their system so even though it wasn't the full optimal solution that our model suggested 
they could still understand how things would change relative to the optimum and relative to their current system. Um, the other thing I've seen uh, people get very excited about is differences in the number of cases that you see in a particular geographic region. So for example, imagine that you're looking at the number of cases in two neighboring um, stroke lower super output areas, um, and that might be 150. Um, so, you, so you might on the face of it think that, oh, well this region's got double the rate of, of this region over the same time period. But if you, if you take a few seconds to think about this, you realize that you need to understand what is the, the population, what's the density within that area, what is the total population. So for example, in this case, I've got two lower super output areas, one and two. One has 100 cases, two has 50 cases, but you can see that the population in two is exactly half of the population in one. So we can see that the rate, though, the percentage of the total population and the cases per 100 of population is identical. So there's no difference in the rate over that time period between those two regions. So it's always worth standardising your data when you're doing your analysis. So figuring out the rate of cases in that region for a particular age range or the total population um, compared to just looking at the raw figures. Another practical issue is that you may be working at a regional level. Say, for example, if you're working with a group of commissioners. Um, so there's an artificial border in your analysis, which is the, the sort of end of the jurisdiction of the, of the commissioners. So what you might find when you look at your data is that the demand will drop off as you approach the region's border. Um, now that might be because um, it might be for real reasons or it might be just an artifact of that border. So the edge cases might be using a facility just on the other side of the border provided by a different commissioner. So really we need to be careful about those points and really understand are they influential in our analysis or not. Um, so you need to check really that your recommendations still make sense given that you know that demand is quite low in particular areas near the region's border. So it's not always easy to do that because you may not have the data. You may not have the data beyond that border, for example. Um, so simple ways to do this might be a sensitivity analysis. So you might, for example, exclude those low regions in a sensitivity analysis to see does that affect your recommendations. The other thing that may happen is if you introduce a shiny new service nearer to the border, you may suddenly, there might be real new demand that appears in that area. It may be unmet demand at the moment, or it may be demand that's currently going over the border into, an, into another service. So you need to think about that. Um, it might be that you just need to flag this as a limitation of what you've done. It might be you need to talk to the commissioners about sourcing additional data. Um, or it might be that you know something about the demographics in the neighbouring region and you do some modelling to estimate how big that demand might be. So you can look at what the impact of that would be on the services provided within the region you're working in. So it's tricky, but you must remember this. It's really important. Often we're working in kind of a, an artificial um, border when really countries are all joined up and work in a network together. So the other practical issue I want to talk to you about is, is really complexity of this analysis. So for small problems, this isn't an issue. And really for small problems, you shouldn't be dipping your toes into optimization or hardcore optimization. But all of these problems are combinatorial optimization problems. Um, and so they're a part of a set called MP hard. And that means that for medium to large instances of these problems, it's not possible to solve them to optimality. Um, so you may say, well, that's, you know, things are getting better over time. So we're, we're much better now at 
um, solving these big problems because we just throw cloud computing at it or more grunt at it with our with our bigger computers. So here's here's a little example of of why that doesn't always work. Um, so for example, if we've got a location problem where um, basically there are two to the n combinations, um, we could throw the Summit supercomputer at it. Um, so this is a very, very powerful computer. So it can calculate 200 petaflops floating point operations per second. Okay, so that's two times 10 to the 17 operations per second. Uh, if that doesn't mean anything to you, what I can say is that's very fast for a computer. So let's have a look how long it would take to search through all combinations of a number of um, different sized problems. So if you're working in a small region with 10 or 60 combinations, it's going to take anywhere between zero and six seconds. So yeah, you can relax about that. That's not a problem. But if you just go up to 70 combinations, so 70, 70 um, facilities, I should say, that's 1.18 uh, times 10 to the 21 combinations, you're starting to make one of the fastest supercomputers in the world sweat. Okay, so that's going to take 1.6 hours on the fastest supercomputer. Well, at the time, this is the fastest supercomputer in the world. If we go up to 120 options for your facilities, so say you're analysing England, that's 1.33 times 10 to the 36 combinations. And it would take the Summit supercomputer 210 billion years to do that calculation. And I don't know about you, I don't have that sort of time on my hands. So. It is a complex problem and you will need to use proper optimization techniques in order to deal with that. Okay, welcome back. So let's finish by a very brief introduction to routing and scheduling in healthcare. So let's go back to our original map. Now remember, this was a map of dialysis services where the stars represented the health delivering facilities and the dots represented the patients. Now let's assume that some of these patients are unable to travel themselves to the facility for healthcare. So the service provides patient transport services to travel out and pick up those patients. Now this in itself is an optimization problem. So let's assume we have this group of patients. So the problem is how do we best pick up these patients while meeting their requirements, meeting their appointment times and minimising travel distance. So this is one particular way you could do it. So for example, we could group those first three groups, three patients together in one route and the second in the second four patients in, in that route. So the so remember the vehicle will have a capacity constraint as well. So for example if that if the ambulance can only carry four patients at a time, that's the maximum number that you can go out and pick up in one go before coming back. So there's a difference here in the type of problem than what we've just seen with location analysis. So these, te these problems are generally for customers who need to make routine decisions. These are decisions that need to be made on a daily level, a weekly level or a monthly level. Whereas in location analysis, we were really looking at a one-off decision, a big change to, the recon uh, to reconfigure their health service across a geographic patch. So classic applications of routing and scheduling in healthcare include allocating and routing community or district nurses to patients' homes. So these are nurses who work um, out of, for example, a GP practice or um, an outpatient clinic who are travelling out to visit patients in their own home and deliver healthcare. And then we've just seen an example of patient transport services where a non-emergency ambulance is travelling out and picking up patients and bringing them into an outpatient facility or a hospital. Now it turns out these problems can be very complicated indeed. And in healthcare, we generally call them what's called a rich 
vehicle routing problem. So that means it's a, it's a vehicle routing problem that has a, a large number of complex constraints um, and aspects to the problem. So for example, there may be many types of demand out there. There may be different types of patients that you need to serve with your health service. So that could include patients with different conditions or health problems. And you've also got different types of assets that you need to send out to serve your patients. So for example, you may have very specialist nurses or senior nurses who are able to treat wounds. And there may be other nurses within your team who are unable to do so. So it doesn't matter if at a particular time of day you have um, a low skilled nurse near a patient who needs wound care, that, that nurse cannot go and treat that patient. It may be that from the other side of the city, um, a nurse with more higher skills has to travel all the way across to treat that patient and there's no choice but to do that. So that adds a lot of complexity to the problem. And bear in mind that these nurses will have limited availability because they work in shifts, they're not available all the time. And one of the big problems with, these, with this type of work is time windows. So that might be, for example, that uh, in the nursing problem, a patient needs to receive insulin injections at a certain time of day. Or for example, in the patient transport problem, that might be because a patient has um, a appointment which takes place at a very specific time of day. So you need to be careful how you group patients together and how far you go in order to avoid missing that appointment or being late for that appointment. So a few closing remarks. So what we've seen in this introduction is that geospatial problems in health are largely split between location allocation, which tend to be big one-off decisions, and routing and scheduling, which tend to be routine decisions made on a regular basis. The point I've tried to put across in this is there's often a lot of benefit for healthcare customers by providing them initially a straightforward ana analysis of the problem. And that might include a visualization of where demand is coming from or what type of demand is out there using maps. And what we're gonna do in this course is learn how to develop those maps. It's always worth bearing in mind that your work is not the be all and end all to a decision maker it will often form part of a wider evidence base. Decision makers are synthesizing lots of types of evidence to make their decision. And that'd be particularly true in those big one-off strategic decisions about how to configure a service, which can be highly political and may involve closing or moving services from one community to another.